There we go. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Happy Friday. Happy grade school. Excited to be with you guys. If you can hear a bit more of an echo in my mic than normal, it's because I'm in a new space. Getting it all set up this week. It's raw, but it's going to be beautiful. So I'm excited about that. I'm having a, a hectic week getting all of my my color cave transitioned from point A to point B, but enjoying the process. I drank a pot of full caffeine coffee this morning. I'm usually a half-calf guy, so I'll probably talk twice as fast, but maybe that's great. Maybe we'll get more in in this next hour of grade school. Uh, super excited to be with you guys. Uh, we are going to be focusing on Q&A for the uh, pre-recorded video that I posted earlier this week, part three, the final part of our DaVinci Wide Gamut Workflow series. So I'm really here to answer your questions on uh, that video and anything uh, sort of related to that subject. My buddy Rafa is here with me. He's gonna help me get all those questions answered. And uh, the hour is gonna be uh, for you guys uh, to ask your questions about that subject. Before we dive in, just a couple of things I wanna share with y'all announcement-wise. First of all, I mentioned last week that there's gonna be a couple of exciting course announcements coming very soon. I can give you a little bit more detail about one of those. Uh, very soon, uh, next week probably, we are going to be announcing uh, my first full spectrum color grading course that I'm gonna be doing for you guys. Uh, we are gonna have a limited enrollment on that, so it's gonna be a, a set cap on uh, the number of students who uh, can join. And it's really meant to be a course that's gonna take you from being sort of at uh, the beginning stage of a career as a professional colorist and getting you up to uh, what we would call like sort of minimum viability as a professional colorist to where you can do good work, you can make your clients happy and you can make money at the same time. That's really the goal of the course. And of course, uh, as you guys know, uh, we are going to try to really bake right into that process, developing best practices and uh, doing things not just in whatever way they work, but doing things in the optimal way, in the ideal way that facilitates uh, optimal creativity and also optimal efficiency because that's the biggest connection to your ability to make money as a professional. If you can do something in one hour that it takes the other guy three hours to do, then you are going to have a better profit margin and be able to have a, a better, more thriving business and get to spend more of your life doing the other things uh, that matter to you beyond uh, just simply color grading. So I'm very excited about that. We're gonna be announcing details uh, of that, uh, like I said, probably next week. Uh, keep your eye out for it because like I said, we're gonna keep enrollment limited so that we can have a uh, class size that really allows us to give you one-on-one uh, -on -one attention and help to build you up. And uh, as I said, in that course, we are gonna cover a full battery uh, of topics. We're gonna cover color grading 101. We're gonna build up our practice from zero. We're gonna talk about building your business. There's gonna be all kinds of supplemental materials included in that, including your very own practice project uh, shot on uh, an area Alexa that you can work on your grading on and use for your demo reel. Uh, there's gonna be an exclusive set of of LUTs that uh, no one else is gonna get except uh, those of us who are in the course together and all kinds of business aids as well to help you figure out how do I quote for projects? How do I invoice for projects? How do I budget my time? All this sort of like administrative uh, and business stuff that uh, plays as much of a role in your ability to do good work and make money at it as uh, any of the fun tools that we tend to talk more about uh, here in grade school. So very excited about that. Uh, I'm trying to think of anything else I need to mention uh, about the course. That's it for now. We're going to share some more very soon. Keep your uh, eyes peeled and your ears open because uh, it's going to be a really, really good time. We're going to be doing that uh, June 16th through 19th. So it's coming up fast and it's going to be an awesome time. I'm really excited to be there with you guys. I guess the last thing that I would mention on that is this is certainly oriented and going to be, uh, um, how do I put it? It's going to be a good fit, even if you are coming to color grading, if you're very new to it. Uh, I'm not going to assume any prior knowledge on your part, so it's a good fit if you're just getting started in color grading. But the other thing that I would mention is it's a really good fit if, like I've found in many times in my career, you find yourself at a spot where you're like, you know what, I feel like it's time to sort of do a rebuild on my entire practice, whether that's your creative practice, your professional practice, your business itself. I've done this many times in my career where I say, okay, let's take the car apart and see if we can't put it back together more cleanly, more simply, more efficiently, more optimally. 
that would be the other sort of uh, potential uh, participant in this course that I think would get a ton of value out of it. Because this, as I said, we're gonna be building up from zero and building up from zero is a really, really powerful place to begin the process because it means that you can do things as they ought to be done rather than having to deal with things that are already in place that you don't wanna bump or shift. So th that would be uh, another really great fit for uh, this course. Anyway, more details to come. Hope to see you guys there. Uh, next week, I'm also going to be uh, releasing the update that I've mentioned to my Kodak 2383 scene referred look that is available in its current form in the uh, description of today's show. Uh, I'm going to be releasing an update to that that, as I mentioned last week, is really oriented around uh, getting a bit of a better negative model incorporated in there and the net result being uh, a more pleasing overall transform that uh, works nicely and does even a little bit better with memory colors like skin and sky and foliage than the current version. Current version's great. If you haven't gotten it already, download it now just so you can compare to the new one. But the new one's going to be coming out next week, and I'm really excited to share that. Excuse me. Share that with you guys uh, as well. And that's it. Other than that, all my other goodies, my mid-gray exposure chart, uh, my exposure or my mid-gray cheat sheet, I should say, my exposure chart, DCTL, all those other freebies and goodies are uh, linked in the show description as well. So be sure to check those out if you have not. And that's all I got. Uh, I've got a couple of uh, favorite comments uh, from uh, this week's video that I'm uh, happy to address to start. But curious, Rafa, if we got any questions coming in on DaVinci Wide Gamut Workflow Part 3. We have questions but about your root package. Not exactly about DaVinci Wide Gamut yet. Okay, let's hold off on the LUT uh, ones for now. Maybe we can come back to those. I'm just going to quickly demo here in Resolve a question that uh, came in uh, this week or a, a, an answer to a comment that came in this week that I thought was a good one. So we had a comment, it was a very simple one, like why are you doing, there was a, a point in the video where I was talking about sort of one of the key portions of my creative uh, or my sort of like fine tuning pass that we covered in part three being uh, to really shape light and knock things down around my healthily exposed subject. So for example, let, let's say I want to knock down the heat coming off of this uh, white tablecloth here a little bit and draw the eye a bit more in toward my subject. I could do a little power window here, or better yet, I think the question was related to uh, this move I do where I take the aspect to 100 with a circular power window to effectively get a grad. So maybe this isn't the exact shape I would do for this actual adjustment, but let's just kind of mock it up and say that it is. So something like that, right? Where I'm just effectively turning my circular power window into a grad. And the question was, well, why are you doing that instead of using the grad that you have right here? And I'm curious, I'm gonna hold everyone in suspense for just a second, especially any of y'all who have read my book, The Colorist 10 Commandments. I'm curious if you have an answer that you can sound out in the chat. I wish we had less latency in there, but we, there is a bit of lag. You can sound out your answer in the chat or just answer to yourself. Why do you think that might be? Based on uh, what you know about uh, my philosophy and approach or what you've read in the Colorist Ten Commandments, why might I choose to do grads always, always with a circular power window as opposed to just using the grad here in uh, the power window section of Resolve? I'm going to give you just a second to think about that while I just demo, you know, doing a nice soft shape like this and controlling the light like so. And also talking about, as we did in the video, that depending on whether you actually have a reference monitor, which you should, but if you don't, you may need to go down here to your power window and actually turn that off so that you can evaluate what you're doing because it's virtually impossible to evaluate whether or not you're having the appropriate effect when you've got that big ugly window outline on top of the exact area where you're evaluating your work. So I think something like that would be a good example of that kind of like soft shaping of light that we talked about as being a simple refinement that can really elevate the overall image and guide the eye. Um, and I'm sure that wasn't enough time to let things uh, sort of trickle in in the chat, but let me just, um... oh, I, I guess we did get a couple answers in here. Let's take a look. Uh, let's see. Yeah, Andreas says better control of fall off. Jim says creates a light flag simulating uh, on set. Yeah, these are all uh, good answers and could be potential answers. My answer is actually even simpler. This is not something I explicitly talk about in uh, my book, but it's part of the principles that I talk about in my book. Two tools is not as good as one tool, right? 
So if I can do all of my power windows with just the circular power window, that means that I don't have to switch between multiple windows or pick different windows and then say, oh no, that one doesn't work quite right. Let me flip over to this one. If I just have one tool that serves all of my purposes, that's simpler and easier and allows me to get faster with just that one tool than if I uh, were toggling between multiple tools depending on the scenario. So basically, because there's nothing that I can't do with a circular power window that I could do with a grad, I'm saying, why would I add another tool into the toolbox and crowd the toolbox? I'm just gonna use this one tool and repurpose it for whatever application I have in mind. So it's a really simple uh, reason, and there's no, re no, no like firm reason why you wouldn't wanna, why you couldn't use a grad. But the other thing that I would say is like, let's actually take this as a good example for a moment and say, maybe I started here. Maybe I started by saying, I think what I need is a little corner grad down here to knock down this table. And then maybe I look at it and observe what I actually think here, which is that, well, I don't really wanna knock this down because this is already naturally kind of falling off uh, as it is getting further away from the source over here on my right. So maybe I wanna make this just a bit circular. Maybe it's still gonna be quite ovular, but maybe I do wanna add a little bit of shape so that it's not extending indefinitely on that horizontal axis. That's super easy to do when I've drawn my grad with a circular power window, I just choke that aspect in a little bit. Whereas if I have a grad down here, I have to go back over to my circular window, recreate it so that I can have control over this sort of horizontal uh, dimension of the grad itself. So like this, honestly, this is more what I would actually wanna do in this situation, is just knock down the area where the key light is really skipping hard off of this tablecloth and not so much influence this area because you can see I've basically, by limiting it to this area, I've kind of homogenized this tablecloth a bit more. So another good reason why I like to do circular power windows over uh, like a, a grad or a gradient. Uh, any other questions trickling in? Hey, choose the best tool. Sola says it. That's absolutely right. That, that relates to this very much. Anything else out there, Rafa? Or should I keep uh, going with the, the questions that I wanted to answer? I'd say keep going. We don't have really questions about DaVinci yet. Okay. But a couple about your loot package. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, I'm trying to actually, the, it's slipping my mind now. There was one other uh, key one that I wanted to address because I thought it was a really good question and it's escaping me at the moment. Yeah, I tell you what, let, let, let's go to uh, some of the luck questions for now and then we can, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to DaVinci Wide Gamut Workflow as soon as we get some of those questions. Okay. A question from Harry Rompainen. The elements loads are great, thanks. However, shouldn't we first correct the original image, for example, white balance, and only after that apply the element LUTs? Great question. Yes, absolutely. So if we look at like the sort of like ideal, some of the pr rules and principles that I would keep in mind when using my elements LUTs or any creative uh, uh, scene referred LUT that you're using, which you should choose carefully, as we've talked about. Uh, but assuming you have uh, a good, reliable, well-selected uh, LUT that you are using, one of my principles that I really don't deviate from is that look should be the very last thing before your final output transform. So if we go to the elements LUTs here, and I do, let's do like a, a summer, and then let's go... I've been playing around lately with doing the palette and then the tone. Uh, at first I was kind of liking doing it the other way, but I'm kind of enjoying doing palette and then tone these days. So I would do those things, if I'm doing them at the clip level at all, they would be the very last thing in my clip node graph, or I would do them at group post clip over here, or even at my timeline level immediately to the left of my final output transform. But yes, absolutely. In addition to your white balancing and your other initial measures, you should do all of your grading upstream, really, of these LUTs. I'm not going to say that you can't do anything downstream of them, but just take as an easy example here. Let me show you something. Let's take a look at the at a grayscale ramp and evaluate the way that the just the tone LUT is treating this ramp. So if I turn my uh, palette off and look at just my tone and go to a waveform here, so if I turn this off, pure linear ramp, right? If I turn this on, 
I am reshaping my what, what we could call my scene linear values. I don't mean that I'm actually in a linear tone curve right now because I'm not. But what I mean is that before I apply this, I have a, I, a logarithmic encoding of scene linear values, if that makes sense. So the relationship between really hot specular highlights, uh, you know, like sitting up above and really deep shadows down below, that relationship is preserved from what the camera originally saw. My preference when I'm grading is to do all of my work with that relationship intact and then to apply a look, which is going to change that relationship. You can see highlights are being compressed here. Shadows are being compressed down here. That relationship is changing with this tone LUT. That's by design. I want it to do that, but I generally want to do all of my grading prior to that happening. And I generally don't want to do any grading after this has been cooked into the negative and has, uh, to you know, put it in one sense, distorted my original scene linear values. I want to operate on my image in as close to its photographed scene state as I possibly can, and then apply uh, my macro level look like I'm uh, creating with the elements LUTs here as the very last link in the chain prior to actually outputting for whatever display I am targeting. Um, yeah, let's keep going with uh, whatever questions we got out there, Rafa. If we got stuff on workflow, great. If not, then we can uh, kind of freestyle here. We have a question regarding DaVinci White Gamut from Post Color Gear. Can great. you provide a practical example about why you'd go into DaVinci White Gamut as opposed to just working in any other scene referred space, such as S-Log? Better roll off, better gradients? Very good question. Yeah, so here, here is the very long and short of it. Uh, and I always mean to have a good example image in here, and I never seem to. Um, let's see. I'm going to flip over, and you guys are going to look at my face while I find some stuff in my resolve so you're not looking behind the curtain at forbidden things. I'm going to find a piece of footage that... Uh, really demonstrates what I want to show you guys effectively. It's a very cut and dry reason why we would want to do that, okay? Um, it's not nearly as complicated as we might think. Let's see here. Here we go. This is one that I think I've played around with in grade school before, but it's an easy one to give an example of what I want to show. Uh, okay, so let's do that, and then let's go back to my resolve, and then have a look at this image here, okay? This is an airy image, so I've got a group set up for airy material right now, and I'm in DaVinci Wide Gamut right now, just so we're all clear. So I'm going airy to DaVinci Wide Gamut, and then I'm going DaVinci Wide Gamut to 7 or 9, okay? So let's just do an easy example here. Like, let's grab a still of that. And I'm going to do an example with aces, but this applies to any color space, really, like this, the, the, the uh, principle that I'm going to demonstrate here. So let's just remove this from the group for a moment so that it's not getting any special treatment. And I'm going to turn off my output transform. And now, instead of going through uh, like a resolve color management pipeline, I'm going to do an aces pipeline. Now. ACES, as of ACES 1.3, has come up with some better solutions for this stuff. But just for the sake of example, I'm going to demonstrate this with a legacy ACES pipeline. And this principle, as I said, is going to travel or it's going to apply to virtually any color space uh, other than DaVinci Wide Gamut. So let's go down here, CCT, and then we're going to go out to Rec. 7 or 9. So an equivalent pipeline for Alexa just in ACES instead of in uh, DaVinci Wide Gamut. You see this right here? That's why. That's why I prefer DaVinci Wide Gamut these days because it's the largest available color space that we have. So that's not going to happen. That right there is happening because the gamut that the camera was able to capture is larger than the gamut that I'm actually grading in. So when I transform from camera gamut to working gamut, in this case, the ACES AP1 primaries, I get clipping because there are values in the negative that the working container cannot accommodate. And so those values slam into the wall or they go negative and they go upside down and they make this strange artifacty behavior. 
I made this example with ACES and with this image because it's uh, one that I had ready that I know causes this problem. But basically the reason why I these days prefer to work in DaVinci Wide Gamut and why I, I recommend it for all you guys is because that's the only working color space where you can guarantee you're never gonna run into that issue. With any other color space, you're kind of playing like, I won't say Russian roulette. It's like Russian roulette if you had a pistol with maybe a hundred uh, bullets, a uh, hundred bullet chambers instead of six, right? Like it's not going to come up that often, but when it does, when, and it's going to come up, when it does come up, it's going to come up in the middle of a grade when you've got your pipeline built and you're 800 of a thousand shots into the grade and you go, oh, damn it. That thing is flipping upside down. Those values are going weird. I'm getting gamut clipping or whatever it is. It always comes up when you least have the bandwidth to deal with it. So the best insurance policy, the only insurance policy that's really going to guarantee against that would be to work in uh, DaVinci Wide Gamut Intermediate in terms of at least like mainstream off the shelf solutions. DaVinci Wide Gamut is a big massive container that's designed to easily accommodate any camera gamut. So uh, that's why I uh, prefer DaVinci Wide Gamut. There's no other creative implication other than that. There's no change in roll off, like the response of the controls is gonna be different, but negligibly so, like it's nothing that you're just gonna grade through it. You're gonna, you're gonna get the same results uh, that you would in another system. It, the values will just net out maybe a little bit different than you would in another system. So it's a really binary thing for me. It's just, is it a big fat, giant gamut and you know giant tone curve as well that can accommodate all my dynamic range and all the potential uh, color volume I might need to pump through it or not. Um, that's why DaVinci Wide Gamut, I would say, is the, the, the best choice for us in Resolve uh, in 2022. Which is why oh, I'm gonna okay, go back to Okay, we have, let's go to another question, right? Yes, please. Okay. Currently, I work in DaVinci White Gamut Pipeline, but sometimes some tools or LATs work in different color spaces, like ACES or whatever. So, what do so do I create a secondary pipeline in the existing pipeline? So, is it grown? Yeah, this is a this is a, a really good topic to discuss. So, there are two answers to this question. One is short, and one is long. The first answer is yes, you can absolutely do that. You can make a pipeline for if you have a, a scene look that's designed for aces and you're working in DaVinci Wide Gamut, yes, you can make a pipeline that does round trips on either end of that and then you can slot it into your DaVinci Wide Gamut pipeline and be fine. Um, the longer answer is a little bit more complicated. L let's go back to something we've talked about many, many times in grade school here. We've talked about the idea of like, the preferential or the subjective or the variable aspects of different color management systems in terms of the way they do their output transform. And in fact, we just saw in ACES, I can demo it over here just as easily. Let's grab a still. Here is Arri Alexa to 709 via a Resolve Color Management Pipeline, right? I'm just very quickly demoing out an alternative. I'm just gonna do it in a single node. Here is Arri Alexa to Rec 709 via an ACES pipeline. They're not the same, are they? Well, why is that? Isn't it, aren't they equivalent pipelines? And isn't color management supposed to be aimed at technical factors rather than creative uh, intent or about creative manipulation of the image? Why are they different? They're different because uh, to use my favorite expression, you can't fit 10 pounds of dirt into a five pound sack. Our display has smaller dynamic range, lower color volume than our working color space or our camera did. So we have to find a creative way to pack all of that dynamic range and color volume in a pleasing way into what our Rec. 7 or 9 display can reproduce or what any display can reproduce for that matter. They're all gonna have lower dynamic range and color volume than what we originally acquired in, uh, in most workflows. So that's why uh, we see this difference between different systems. So here's where things get tricky. If we use, we can use my elements LUTs as an easy example here, let's say, I'm gonna add myself back into, I'm gonna turn my transform back on rather for Harry. So I'm back in my DaVinci Wide Gamut Pipeline. And let's just say for the sake of argument that I didn't have, oh, you know what, I take it back. The Divin, uh, when I, I, I don't mean the elements LUTs, I mean my um, uh, 2383 LUTs, which as you guys may know, I actually have two versions of. There's a DaVinci Wide Gamut version and there's an ACES version for those of us who are working in that system. So. 
I could, if I wanted, let's say I didn't have the DaVinci wide gamut system. Let's say that the servers that host my LUTs catch on fire tonight and the only remaining copy of this LUT in the world is the ACES version, but I'm working in DaVinci wide gamut and I wanna use it. How can I go about that? Well, from a technical POV, I could apply this LUT like so. And then if I bookend this with some transforms and say, uh, that's actually not what I wanna do. I'm gonna use a color space transform for this. And then I do exactly what was suggested of like, oh, can I do a pipeline within a pipeline? You can, you can say, well, I'm starting in DaVinci Wide Gamma and Intermediate. I want temporarily to transform into ACES CCT and probably gamut map along the way because as we just talked about, DaVinci Wide Gamut is larger than ACES AP1 here. And then I want, after I apply this look, I wanna go right back to where I started. So we're gonna do this backwards. We're gonna come from ACES AP1, ACES CCT, and we're gonna go back out to DaVinci Wide Gamut, DaVinci Intermediate, and I can turn my saturation compression off now. And just as a quick example, if I, let's see, let me make sure I'm getting this right. Wide Gamut Intermediate, AP1 CCT, good. AP1 CCT, Wide Gamut Intermediate, white point adaptation on in both places. Let's turn this gamut mapping off for now because that's making things funky. Um, what I was driving at uh, just a moment ago is I want at the baseline just to confirm like, okay, when I turn these two things on and off, the round trip is netting me no change whatsoever, right? I'm just moving into the adjacent room, moving into another room for a minute, and then I'm going back to the room I started in, if that makes sense. The only difference is when I do something in that second room that I've moved into, in this case, applying the 2383 LUT. So if I do that, I've now got this, here is adapting that ACES CCT LUT for DaVinci Wide Gamma Intermediate. Let's grab a still of that, okay? Now, let's reset all my grades and nodes and let's just check something out here. What if I now apply the DaVinci Wide Gamut version? I should have a match, right? Because if I'm soundly adapting the ACES version and accounting for the color space that it was set up for, and then I'm applying a DaVinci Wide Gamut version that's designed to work in this exact pipeline, we would expect if the answer, if the short answer that I started this conversation with is the only answer, we would expect the answer would be yes, right? Those should be one-to-one, -one. those should match. We're just using technical factors to align them. But let's look and see what actually happens. No such luck. It doesn't work that way, does it? You wanna know why it doesn't work that way? Because the ACES CCT LUT was not just designed to take ACES CCT in and spit ACES CCT out, but the designer, in this case me, developed that LUT, made the creative decisions for that LUT under an ACES flavor of display transform, not under a resolve color management flavor of transform. Does that make sense? So even if you are adapting a LUT, you have to be mindful that if that LUT was designed for a different flavor or family of display transform, you have to be mindful that you are even after you correctly adapt it, not going to be getting the results that the designer signed off on at the end of the process. Now, that doesn't actually mean you can't do it. Like if I go back to the still that I saved here, like that's not terrible. You could grade under that. There's like, and it probably, if uh, this pipeline is sound and there's nothing funky happening with these transforms, so there shouldn't be, or which there shouldn't be, I should say, um, you're probably gonna get mid-gray preserved. You're, pr you're still getting some nice colorimetry. Like it wouldn't be crazy to grade underneath this, but it's also helpful to recognize that the designer, this is not what the designer signed off on. This is something else because it is being reproduced under a different display transform, under a different rendering intent. So that's the very long second answer to that question. Short answer, yes. Long answer, maybe, depending on whether that LUT was designed for the same display transform that you are using or for a different one. Okay, if the material is a low quality Rec. 709, should I work with DaVinci White Gamut? Is there any downside? This is a good question. We haven't talked about this in a while. Um, in general, I would say no. Um, there is an edge that you'll be able to see when you're working with material like that there's a very far outer edge where like if a piece of 709 material is so fragile and so brittle that just that round trip of exploding it out to a DaVinci wide gamut to a log space and then back down to 709 
just that round trip is like beating up on the image even more, I won't do it. But that's a really far outer edge case. That's like for archival video that you got from a secondary master. Like I've encountered that with documentary work before. Where it's like, oh, I just need to like do as little as possible to this as I can, including even color managing it because it's so brittle. It's like when archeologists find, you know, like uh, ancient texts and they can't even open the book because it's gonna destroy the book. Same kind of principle here. You, that, you, in those cases, you wanna be like, all right, how little can I get away with? Like maybe I'll just trim my gain or something and leave it the hell alone. Other than that situation, uh, no, no downside to round tripping into DaVinci Y Gamma and Intermediate. It should net you a neutral round trip. And all it's gonna do, as we've talked about in prior episodes of grade school, is allow you to operate on your image in the same state as uh, you're operating on all your other images. And the only other thing I would say there is there's of course the caveat that just because you explode, in this case, if you take a five pound, uh, if you take five pounds of dirt and put it into a 10 pound sack, that doesn't mean you have 10 pounds of dirt. It means that you have a 10 pound sack. So you still need to be mindful of that source and give it a lighter touch and do less with it than you would with like a pristine piece of, uh, you know, like cinema camera footage, but at least your working environment is the same. At least you can use the same tools, even if you have to take a lighter touch with them. Okay, let's go to grading for a second. There's a question that Jim wanted to be asked for a couple of weeks. Chromatic bias of color. When a skin tone is surrounded by a color that makes our brains falsely see the skin tone look off, do you change the skin hue to make it look right or the background? After your last video, I'm guessing the background as you did with the washing mach machines behind the lady. Cool question. I hadn't thought about that for a while. I think your guess is right. I th it's probably like a case by case thing, but I, I, think, I think that would probably be how I would handle that. I would try to get some sort of like objectively accurate or pleasing skin tone somewhere in the neighborhood of my skin tone indicator, which as you guys know, I don't think of as a holy grail, but I do think of as a good sort of like compass bearing. I probably would aim my skin tone at that. And if it were feeling weird because of surrounding uh, elements, then I probably would sculpt those around the good skin tone. Yeah. Uh, and curious, Jim, what you would do, you'd leave a, leave a comment in the chat. Uh, I'm curious if, if it's the same for you or if you would do something different or for any of you guys that matter. Um, that's, a, that's an interesting one to think about that's probably has to do with being sensitive to the particulars of the shot or the show. Uh, but I think that would kind of be my, my prevailing logic, yeah. Okay, from EC Sonka, the hexadecimal codes for colors like pure red, pure green, or pure blue are different from one color space to another. Like in Surge or 709, the pure red is the same as in ACES or other white gamut space. Uh, well, that's a tricky one to, to like give a clear answer on. No, like if I want to express pure red in an ACES container, that's one zero zero. That's the triplet. Pure red, no green, no blue. If I want to express pure red in Rec 709, that's also one zero zero. Pure red, pure green, pure blue which you could derive a, a hexadecimal code from uh, if you wanted to. In general, that's not something we use much in motion imaging because hex codes tend to be um, correlated to, I think, an 8-bit encoding system, if I'm remembering correctly. It's more of a stills, like Photoshop type convention. But yeah, the, the, so no, those are actually all going to point to pure red within whatever container you're in, but pure red itself has a different uh, rendering depending on the color space that you're in. So obviously we couldn't even, there, there's no display that can reproduce an, an, a triplet of one zero zero in ACES. We don't have a display in the world that could reproduce that value currently. Whereas we have many displays that could re reproduce that value in Rec 7 or 9. So the actual red that you see will be different, but the value and its relationship to the rest of the color space uh, will actually be the same. Uh, regardless of the color space that you're in. And, you know, you could contemplate the same example any way you want it to say like, oh, you know, like pure yellow, you know, like one, one, zero, uh, one red, one green, zero blue. 
that would also be, you know, like pure yellow in ACES or pure yellow in Rec. 7 or 9. But again, that yellow is going to have a different appearance depending on uh, the color space that you are operating in. Okay, let's go back to DaVinci White Gamut. This question is from Sasha Feferia. And regarding DaVinci White Gamut and color management at the project level, is there any equivalent to the saturation compression that we see in the color space transform in the project settings? Uh, let's see, look, why don't we do, let's have a look here. So if I'm doing like a color managed thing and I'm doing a custom type deal, are, are we talking about like output gamut limiting? I don't actually know where the saturation compression settings in my project settings are. Um, I mean, you are getting, uh, let's see here. Yeah, I don't usually color manage my own uh, projects at this uh, here in the project settings, but I don't actually see an option for gamut compression, I've always assumed that it's actually using uh, like the, the default saturation compression options that we would see or gamut, yeah, saturation compression options that we see here. Um, so if we're talking about this right here, like what I see in a color space transform, if we want to look at alternatives to doing this, it's sort of a two part thing. Like if you want to do this precisely, like technically compress your gamut as you are moving from color space A to color space B, this is the way to do it in Resolve. You don't want to do that in some other fashion because it's just gonna be a compromise uh, or a lesser version of this. However, if you want to do creative saturation compression, um, there are a number of options. The most obvious of which would be a sat versus sat curve which says, you know, like in the same way that my custom curves here, this is a loom versus loom curve, luminance in, luminance out. Over here, this is a sat versus sat curve, sat in, sat out. So I could create a creative saturation curve by doing something like this if I wanted to, where I've got kind of a shoulder on my saturations as they climb from low saturation to high saturation, if that makes sense. So you could definitely contemplate sort of creative saturation compression, which I often do. That's one of the key parts of my Creative process, that's one of the like stock ingredients in like any of the palette LUTs in the elements kit. Those all have some level of saturation compression on there, which is gonna sort of like homogenize uh, low, the range of low to high saturations in the same way that when we do a contrast curve, we kind of wanna homogenize the range from low to high luminance. Uh, so same principle there. And then just to round that out, um, the other thing that you could do in terms of a more technical gamut mapping, as of ACES 1.3, I mentioned this in passing a moment ago, we have this uh, gamut compression built into ACES 1.3. I actually really like this gamut compressor. I think to call it like a really rigorous technical gamut uh, compression algorithm might be, might not be accurate um, because it really is designed to be a simple and effective means of compressing out of gamut values back in, but it's not as sophisticated as uh, say the the average chapter of a book that I've had occasion to mention a couple times in the last couple episodes of grade school, gamut mapping algorithms um, that like goes into incredible detail about in true 3D space mapping uh, points outside of a cube back inside of it. It's not quite that sophisticated, but it does yield really good results. And you could use it, frankly, creatively or technically, if you went to the parametric version, you've got all these parameters that you can use here to shape what's happening to your saturations as they get higher and higher and higher and closer to that edge. So this would be another thing that you could just kind of play with uh, if you wanted to. I will admit it is not the most intuitive set of sliders in the world, um, but you can kind of get a feel for what's happening here with a little bit of practice. And uh, it's definitely it can be a powerful tool for creative or technical saturation mapping. But again, I would not see this as uh, a great alternative to the technical saturation mapping that I'm getting in a color space transform. I would prefer to, if I'm going from say, a big color space to a small color space, I would prefer to handle the gamut mapping uh, component of that, which is important. I would prefer to handle that here with saturation compression rather than here, uh, just because this algorithm is uh, not quite as sophisticated. Um, so I hope that gives you some stuff to think about.
Okay, so what is the actual reason for gamut clipping? We often encounter gamut cl clipping while working with a bright light source, something like neon or something. How do you encounter it and why? Yeah, great question. That, that's, th th this is, uh, again, kind of speaks to the, the fact that we're asking that question goes right to uh, the last chapter of my book, The Colorist Ten Commandments. Uh, which is linked in the description. If you uh, want to check it out, you've got 17 bucks to spare. I think it's well worth it. Um, we talk about in the last chapter of that book, questioning assumptions. And for me, like that, qu that question is a great one that I can remember asking in the early days of ACES when I was using it, when it was just this accepted thing of like, uh, you know, you get unlucky, you park on the wrong image. And even though you've got a perfectly set up pipeline, that's going to go nuclear. And I can remember being kind of the only person in the room going like, why is that? <laughs> like, shouldn't that not be a thing? So it's a great question to ask. Um, there are many different specific reasons that there can be for getting gamut clipping, but really what it comes down to is if we imagine color space. First of all, we need to remember that we call color spaces color spaces for a reason. That's because they're three-dimensional. They're not color um, planes, right? It's not a flat 2D thing the way that we see like that CIE horseshoe represented so often. Color is three dimensional. Color spaces are three dimensional. And any actually any time. Oh, looks like my mic went funky for a second, but hopefully looks like it's working now. Anytime that we are moving from color space A to color space B, and any point in color space A falls outside the boundaries of color space B we have the potential for gamut clipping. That's it. That's the only macro level fundamental reason for gamut clipping is when you are migrating from color space A to color space B and color space B cannot fully absorb the uh, boundaries of color space A and you haven't incorporated some sort of scheme to deal with those edge cases and bring them inside of the container. So there's lots of different reasons for that. It can be like the reason that we talked about with ACES, where like, well, the ACES AP1 color space is actually smaller than, for example, the airy wide gamut color gamut. Like that's documented. So if you have a hot enough value in airy wide gamut, it's going to fall outside of that boundary. Then it's just a question of the right image being captured and run through your pipeline. Um, and it's all going to be variations on that theme. Uh, the other one that can happen that's a little bit less common is this is getting really into uh, the weeds here, so I won't spend too much time on it. But suffice it to say that color management frameworks, all color management frameworks today are kind of dumb. Um, they're, they're sort of a best fit. They're making a really broad exercise of transforming I don't know, Airy Alexa into DaVinci Wide Gamut Intermediate. The mechanisms by which we do that are pretty broad and pretty insufficient, actually. It's enough to get you in the ballpark, but you haven't actually moved your, uh, say, if I do a color space transform from, uh, let's say, Alexa to Red Wide Gamut RGB, you haven't actually very accurately mimicked how the sensor would have responded to that light if it were a red sensor in the first place. You've just made a kind of broad exercise of it. So what can happen because we use broad methods and means and because those methods, the, the math for those and the, num the, the data for those is being provided by camera manufacturers, sometimes you can get edge cases simply because the math is not sufficient to describe the nuance of the change from one space to another or because the manufacturer actually didn't do a very good job of deriving the data or they uh, derived idealized data as opposed to actual real world data. And you can get issues like that with, um, oh, I don't have the shot handy, but the, I have a, a, an R3D shot in my library that suffers from that exact condition where it's like, no, I'm color managing properly. I'm going into DaVinci Wide Gamut Intermediate. There's not an issue with my pipeline. What there's an issue with is that the sensor actually captured something different than is described by the primaries of Red Wide Gamut RGB. That one's far less common, but it can happen. And when it does, you'll usually find yourself scratching your head because you can't figure out any other link in the chain that might be the culprit. But uh, that's that's a less common one. But it, again, macro level short answer. Gamut uh, clipping errors come from uh, anytime you're moving from one color space to another, and the second color space is not sufficient to uh, wrap its arms around all the potential data points of the first. 
Okay, so when using a node-based color managed DaVinci uh, Intermediate Workflow, I noticed that placing noise reduction after my final output gives little to no visible results, while placing it before the first color space transform works as intended. Any idea as to why? Yes, great question. Let me give it to, uh, let me answer the, the question in this way. If you're baking a cake, and you add, mm, I don't know much about baking, uh, but let's pretend I do. Let's say you're baking a cake and you've put all your recipes and all your ingredients into the bowl. And, uh, or, or rather you've got them, you've got everything like, yeah, you've got it in the bowl and you're ready to like, you know, put it into a pan and cook it. And let's say you add a half a tablespoon of baking soda, okay? Think about the effect that's likely gonna have on the recipe, that's gonna do something, right? I don't know anything about baking, but I know that's gonna change the result, right? Compare that to if you pour that half a tablespoon of baking soda onto the cooked cake when it comes out of the oven. That's not gonna do much, right? It's just gonna make that bite of the cake taste kind of weird. It's the same kind of thing. The reason why we're seeing that is because that noise reduction is then being run through that display transform and getting that massive hit of it's, it, it's being um, magnified, if you will, by that uh, final display transform in your color management pipeline. And generally speaking, that's a good thing. Like that's why we want to noise reduce and do everything else in scene space, not in display space. Because in display space, it really is a good analogy, the cake one. Like you don't wanna be tweaking your cake recipe after the cake has come out of the oven. You wanna be tweaking your cake recipe before it goes in, right? You have less ability, it's less maneuverable, less changeable, and you have to hit it harder to get any result at all. And when you do, it's probably not gonna be that good of a result. Like think about actually wanting to, if you wanna make your cake more fluffy after it's come out of the oven, I guess you could try, but it's not gonna look great and it's not gonna have, uh, it's, you're gonna have to be, you're gonna have to beat up on that cake and it's not gonna like result in at all the same uh, results you would have gotten as if you had changed the recipe before it went into the oven. So that's the, the reasoning there. I hope that helps clarify it a little bit. When using DaVinci Film Lux LUTs and mastering for 709, why would one to use a different white point than D65 instead of adding work manually using grading tools like curves or lift gamma gain, for example? Oh, that's a good question. So uh, the, what, what we're asking here is like, if I turn off all of my color management and the question is, if I'm using these legacy Resolve Film Looks LUTs and I wanna use a 2383, why would I use instead of just a 709 Kodak 2383, which by the way, doesn't look great because I'm not feeding film negative into this, which is what this LUT expects. So that's its own uh, issue and one of the reasons why I would avoid using these LUTs, um, but let's say you're happy with the visual result or you're compromising or whatever. The question is like, why would I use the D60 version of this or even the D55 as opposed to the D65? D65 being the native white point of my um, uh, Rec. 709 display. Well, the fundamental reason is just a creative preference, uh, essentially. And I would say like, by the time you're doing this, by the time you're saying, I'm gonna grade underneath this LUT, you've kind of resigned yourself to operating in a suboptimal way where you're saying, well, my creative intent and my rendering intent or my technical transform, they're all being incorporated into one thing, right? Because as we've talked about in prior episodes of grade school, this workflow, other than the fact that I can't actually feed this LUT what it expects, let's say that I can get okay visual results even though I can't feed this LUT what it actually expects, um, this workflow, the, 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 the issue that we're gonna encounter here is that, or, or I'll, I'll put it this way, assuming that we can get go, good results out of this, we're getting them by feel. Like this isn't gonna travel to HDR, it's only ever gonna work for SDR. It incorporates creative and technical parameters all into one. So why would I choose D60 or D55 over the other? It would be fundamentally because I like the creative rendering better. It's not like it's more or less accurate really, like, yeah, it's moving your master white point, and yeah, you could instead do that upstream with nodes, but it's not like that's maintaining some sort of purity, to be honest with you. 
you're already making a huge compromise by using these film looks LUTs because you're not able to feed them what they expect and you're not able to do anything with your master except deliver for SDR, which doesn't mean you can't do that. I know people who use these all the time. I would just say if you are working that way, then at that point, you certainly don't need to be afraid of having a creative mismatch between the white point of your display and the white point being rendered by uh, your hybrid LUT, which incorporates both technical and creative transformation, if that makes sense. Oh, okay. There are uh, still a few things that I don't understand about color spaces and gamma tags slash targets for web. Could you talk a bit more about that? For example, sporting a gamma 2.2 tag to YouTube results in an overly contrasted image that looks nothing like the original picture while using Rec 709A works properly. Yeah, I'm, this is a good thing to talk about. So let's go back into normal color managed world. And I'm just gonna give you guys sort of a, a, a summary of um, the way that I'm currently handling this. So right now I have a Rec 709 or a, an Alexa to Rec 709 pipeline on my Alexa footage. I'm in perfect shape to start grading here. Let's do a a creative look like so. What is this? Oh yeah, I don't want that. That ain't right. Let's go over here. Let's say rain, winter, whatever. Um, so I've got a, a stack built out here and I'm grading and let's say that I'm uh, like very happy with my creative grade. I am monitoring this on a calibrated Rec 709 reference monitor off to my right, okay? The goal, if we just want to, first of all, restate what the actual goal is, because it's easy to lose sight of it with all these things. The goal is that when I'm done here, when I like it, when my clients like it on the calibrated displays that we are judging these images on, the goal is to get as close to that when I watch it on my phone on YouTube or on my MacBook on YouTube or wherever. The goal is to get as close a match to what we all liked here as when we are viewing in that environment on that uh, via that mechanism, right? So the best way to do that is uh, like the Rec 709A tag thing. It actually doesn't matter unless you're dealing with QuickTime player itself, in which case, sure, you can use the Rec 709A tag. But I'll tell you guys the way that I actually handle this today. So let's say that this is my final locked perfected grade. We all love how this looks on the calibrated displays here in the room. Now all we got to do is ship it, but we want to ship it for YouTube and we want to get the best possible match on YouTube to what we saw in the room. The way that I do that is with my free web viewing transform here. And all this is gonna do is account for the mismatch that you are going to get 10 times out of 10, regardless of how you tag your image, you're gonna get the same mismatch between, a, between what you started with and, and what YouTube shows. You're gonna get the same mismatch every time. So I would just tack this on to the very end of my chain it's no longer gonna look quite correct here in my room. It's gonna deepen uh, my uh, shadows and do a couple of other things. But what will happen is this, when I uh, render it out with this applied, when I view this in my YouTube window, it is going to give me a best possible match to that, if that makes sense. And the tags actually will not make a difference whatsoever. So in that case, my uh, suggestion for everyone is don't try to game the system unless you absolutely have to because someone's insisting on viewing it in quick time, which I always try to educate my clients about and encourage them against. Say, hey, let me give you a frame IO link and watch it there. I promise it's gonna be a more accurate reproduction than looking at it in quick time. Um, at, and at that point, my color space tags and my gamma tags, I don't game the system. Be honest, it's Rec 709 Gamma 2.4. That's what I mastered. And then all you're gonna do specifically for YouTube and frame IO, where I've profiled the behavioral shift between what I feed to those platforms and what they give me back, the, you can apply this for those two specific outlets and get a best perceptual match. That's the latest and greatest on my workflow for getting that match. It's uh, I designed to have minimal compensations, minimal complexity, and minimal duplicity. Because the fact is, when you tag an image Rec 709, Rec 709A, you're lying. That's not true. This is not Rec 709A. It does not have a gamma of 1.95. If you have to do it to get an acceptable reproduction on a problematic uh, viewer like QuickTime, 
okay, that's fine. And if your client's happy and everyone uh, walks away satisfied at the end of the day, that's fine, but it's a huge compromise. So uh, my suggestion would be use that web viewing transform for YouTube and Frame.io. You actually don't need it for Vimeo whatsoever. Vimeo will give you a faithful reproduction without needing to do anything. And then just tag your image honestly. Be honest about what your image is. And you can forget about it from there because honestly, everything else that the, the you're still going to see differences and shifts from your calibrated reference monitor to all, to all the other monitors. That's why, that's the whole point is that we have a bullseye in uh, our grading environment that everything else is going to be sort of clustered around. So you're still going to see that shift, but you will, uh, you can be confident that you have minimized it as much as possible and you've done so without jumping through a bunch of hoops or trying to game the system. And that link, by the way, is available. Uh, that's in the description as well. You can download that for free and try it out for yourself. It's a very simple transform. All it's doing is accounting for something that I've observed for years that's always driven me crazy. It's like, okay, cool, thanks guys. Like it's just a little more open in the toe than it was. Uh, and uh, like I've lost just a little bit of snap in the bottom end of the image. So all this is doing here is countering that measured shift and preempting it by dropping things down so that when they get shifted back up, I get a net neutral to what I originally started with. And as always, our time has flown by. I'm game to do uh, another quick question or two if we've got them. Yeah, let's go back to these YouTube settings from Sasha Zephyria. Regarding that web viewing transform, is it still applicable when I'm only grading and that, and that file will be handed on to the editor? Does the editor have to do something on his side for the final export? No, that's the beauty of it. The editor just needs to, again, not game the system in terms of metadata tags, which most of the time are going to be ignored anyway. But for this, any situations where they won't, you, you want the tags to actually be accurate. And again, uh, that should only be cooked into a render that's going anywhere to an editor or directly to YouTube or Vimeo or uh, YouTube or Frame.io rather, when those are the only destinations, okay? So if you apply this, and then you put it up on a Rec. 709 TV or on some other uh, platform like Vimeo, your results are gonna be wrong. They're gonna be further away from what you saw in the room than when you had it turned off. So you just wanna make sure if you're handing off to an editor, that's totally fine. You can still totally cook it in as long as that editor is only going to render that asset out for YouTube or for Frame.io, if that makes sense. And if they're gonna be doing some stuff for YouTube and or Frame.io and some stuff for uh, other delivery formats, then I would just do two renders and say, hey, here's the web, here's the YouTube Frame.io specific renders, here's the generic Rec. 7 or 9 Gamma 2.4 that will work for everything else. Okay, do you want one more? Yeah, let's do one more. Okay. And can colloid tools be used together with the elements loot, especially with print? Oh, fun question. Yeah, so we're asking if we can use the uh, elements lots with my colloid tools. Uh, you certainly could. I think, in general, like my creative preference, this is unique to individual artists, so this is not like a hard and fast rule. My creative preference is to sort of have one look that I roll with. So if I were using, say, my uh, print tool here uh, in DaVinci Wide Gamut, then I probably would not want to, let's like go to Isabella here. I probably wouldn't want to stack my elements LUTs on top of that or upstream of it because they're both aimed at sort of giving a creative rendering of the image. That's not to say that you couldn't, like you could totally mix and match these or like key output gain these and take like maybe 35% of this piece of palette and maybe 20% of uh, this piece of tone and maybe scale back your, uh, you know, gamut here in the print tool. Like you could mix and match those things and there would be no technical reason why that were, would be wrong. Um, so you absolutely could do that. And then the other one that would be more of a no brainer is like, let's say you have a look that you really love with the elements LUTs, then you could certainly use colloids like image manipulation tools upstream of it to get like, oh, I wanna do an exposure change, a scene linear exposure change in stops natively 
underneath my look, like that would be a no brainer. There's that, that's, that would be a great workflow to use these tools for manipulating the image in tandem with the tools for, uh, with the, the element slots, which are imparting a creative look at the tail of the stack. So yeah, you could in either of those cases mix and match, but certainly in the case of using anything other than the print tool upstream of the element slots, that's a no brainer. And then in terms of stacking the print tool with the element sluts, you could do that too. It would just be, uh, you know, sort of a creative exercise. And I probably, I'm not sure if the, you might have to experiment with like the order that works best for you, but yeah, it would just become a creative exercise at that point of like, can I get something that I like by combining these things that I can't get by using just one of them, if that makes sense. And that kind of takes us full circle to what we started our conversation with today about like, well, if I can do all of my power windows using nothing but circular power windows, that's fundamentally better than doing my power windows, sometimes with grad, sometimes with square, sometimes with circular. It's kind of the same thing here. It's like, well, if I can get the exact look that I'm after with just the print tool or with just the elements LUTs, that's fundamentally better than getting the exact look that I'm after with a combination of the print tool and the elements LUTs. However, if I can't get the exact thing that I'm after with just one of those, then that's the perfect occasion to start combining them and increasing complexity because we need to in the same way that like, you know, I might say, well, sure, it would be nice if I could get the result that I wanted with my gain, but I can't. So I'm instead going to go over to my curves and do something a bit more complex because it's required for what I'm hoping to accomplish. So we don't need to be afraid of complexity, but we need to be aware of where in that sort of like spectrum of complexity we're plotting and make sure that we are keeping things as simple as we possibly can or and as minimal as we possibly can and only adding complexity and variability and multiple tools or manipulations when the current level of complexity that we're at is no longer sufficient. And that's a great place to uh, round out today's session, which we ended up kind of freestyling more than I expected, but we had some great questions out there. And I think a lot of this stuff absolutely goes to sort of like thinking beyond the basics that we've covered in this DaVinci Wide Gamut workflow series and uh, thinking about where you take your practice in terms of grading uh, scene referred and with the photographic principles that I talk about, kind of where you take that from, uh, from here if you've gone through parts one through three of that series. So these are all fun things to start contemplating and really, you know, like getting the basics of a color managed workflow down and understanding the way a particular color management system like Resolve Color Management works is the beginning of uh, you know starting to really exert authorship over the entire journey from light hitting a sensor to light hitting our eyes. Because technically, as colorists, we wanna have control and sort of like mastery of as much of that process as we possibly can. And the more of it we have control over it, the, the more of it we have control over, the more of it that we have mastery over, the better we're gonna be able to serve our creative vision and uh, of course our clients. So I, I hope that's a, an inspiring sort of uh, horizon for you guys to aim at uh, now that we've wrapped up this series. And I'm excited to uh, move on to some uh, new content and topics starting uh, next week. We'll have a new video out and you guys can look forward to that. And then we will see you back here for grade school next Friday. Thank you guys very much for joining. Always a pleasure hanging out with you guys. I hope you'll have an awesome weekend and an awesome week. And I will see you back here. Thanks to Rafa for co-hosting with me. Everyone take care. See you very soon.